Hi everyone, it's Vanessa. I'm here to wrap up some of the things that I've read so far in December. I think this video will end up being me in two different time frames, <laughs> wearing two different outfits because I have to return these books to the library tomorrow. The first thing I want to talk about is definitely Barack Obama's A Promised Land, which is the reason why December started off so slowly for me. It took me literally almost two weeks to finish this audiobook. Certainly it was 29 hours, so that's part of the reason. But I also think that part of it is because I wasn't that excited about the book as I was reading it. Everything that I've heard so far about it, everybody has loved it. And I guess I hadn't read many reviews of people with differing opinions on that. Maybe I might be the first differing opinion that you're hearing about this. I ended up rating it three stars. If I could go back 29 hours and not listen to the audiobook knowing what it is about, I think I wouldn't do that experience over again. This is coming from someone who voted for Obama, someone who mostly agrees with him politically. I mostly came to the book to understand an experience, to understand what being president was like. I'm gonna compare it to Michelle Obama's Becoming because I think Michelle Obama's memoir was a lot more successful in multiple things that I look for in a memoir, which is the storytelling aspect, the feeling that you're getting to know the person and that they're actually letting you in to know them, the emotion that you feel as you are reading it. Right when I was reading Michelle Obama's book, I felt for her. I felt like I understood her. I I felt like I got to know her better, right? And Obama's book was not like that. What I enjoyed the most was that beginning aspect. When you're getting to know him in his organizing days and how he met Michelle Obama and his campaign even in 2008 was really fascinating to hear from his point of view. When he was actually in the job, what the book became was I went to this place to do this meeting, I met this elected official, I tried to get this through Congress and these were the obstacles that I faced and I had some more meetings. It felt like a non-stop detailing of the day-to-day -day life of a president and also a non-stop defense of his own administration which i mean power to him i think i understand where he's coming from considering all the things that have happened since he's left office that he feels like he really needs to defend his record but it became boring it became tedious it became something that i wasn't really super looking forward to listening to on my walks and when i was doing chores and that's not the sign of a good memoir in my opinion either it can be shorter which by the way it's volume one of a two volume series on his presidency so I don't think I'm gonna read the second part. I think a lot of other people have really enjoyed it. Maybe it's just me and what it is that I look for in a memoir. I mean, even if you're president, I would like to connect with you the entire time I'm reading your book. I will say there were really tender and sweet moments too. I just wish that they happened more throughout the whole book. All right, let's talk about two graphic novels that I've read recently. One is Meal, which I don't have that many things to say about because honestly, this was really disappointing. I think I ended up giving it two stars. I was leaning towards like one and a half, honestly. I didn't know what was happening when I was reading this book. It's about a main character who likes to experiment with bugs in food, so like as a delicacy. I thought that was really fascinating and the kinds of things that she thinks about to cook. But I was just kind of like, where are we going? Why is this happening? Not feeling a connection to the characters. After that, I read um, a more successful graphic novel, but also one that I had some issues with, and that was Displacement by Kiki Hughes. I've been really looking forward to this one, actually. In it, basically, we look into the internment camps with Japanese Americans during World War II. The main character is in present day and gets displaced, like it's shipped back in time. It's mostly about this experience where she's trying to get to know her grandmother more who went through all of this. If you read the end of the book, she talks about how she was inspired by Octavia Butler and Kindred to look into history through time travel, mostly because her grandmother did go through all of this and a lot of the things are lost in time because when you go through things like that, a lot of the time people don't talk about it. For that reason, she took this idea, this something that happened truly in her family's history and turned it into a fantastical element. Storytelling wise, I thought this was okay. I think where this truly excelled for me was the artwork. I absolutely love the color palette that she uses and her style. Like this is to a T exactly the kind of look that I love in graphic novels. If you enjoy graphic novels, I do recommend this one. After that, I read a couple you would say mystery thrillers. One of them was The Night Swim by Megan Golden. This is a book that I've seen on booktube and was interested in trying out mostly because it deals 
with podcasting and the true crime podcast of this case. Second was that this deals mostly with a trial instead of like a whodunit. And then the third thing that interested me in this is that it, the trial focuses on rape and also what rape does to a victim who is going through this. I definitely think that those aspects made me enjoy this more than the actual reveals and like mystery aspects of it because there aren't that many in this book. This book maybe has a couple of those moments but it mostly kind of just goes through what has happened to the victim and the victim's family and then it also has an old mystery from like 25 years ago. I think I would have done without the 25 year mystery. I definitely want it to be more in the trial and in the present day than I want it to be 25 years ago. The podcast elements actually kind of disappointed me because they felt more like soliloquies than actual like investigative journalism which is mostly what it's trying to go for but overall I did enjoy this for what it was. It was an interesting mystery. The ending was good I would say. I think I ended up giving it three stars. Another mystery thriller, it looks into sexual mistreatment, sexual abuse, and manipulation that happened to girls. In the acknowledgments, the author really talks about like, this is not an R. Kelly story. To me, this did feel like a ripped from the headlines R. Kelly story. And I think that was part of what took me out of the story so often. What I was reading felt so similar to what I watched when I watched Surviving R. Kelly. I also will say that there were aspects of this that did try to make it like a thriller. I really enjoyed the main character. She was trying to help herself so that she wouldn't go to prison for something that she didn't do, basically like to prove her innocence. And those aspects also felt like unnecessary to me in the story. What I liked the most in the story were those discussions about how easy it is for teen girls to end up in these situations. The way that it's portrayed in this book, that aspect of it, I think is portrayed very well because it doesn't seem completely out of this world that something like that would happen. I think I ended up giving this one three and a half stars. I kind of wish that this book was mostly about all of the victims getting together and talking in group settings, which happens a little bit in this book, but which I wish happened a little bit more. I think this book would have been could have taken a whole other turn that I would have enjoyed more. The next one was a reread so I won't talk very much about it and it's for this one summer by Jillian Tamaki and Mariko Tamaki, one that I think I will continue to reread. It was a very enjoyable reread experience. I actually hadn't read it in four years which kind of blew my mind. It didn't feel like it had been that long. The thing that I took away from it this time is still the climax of the story and how the young girl calls to her mother in a time of need and her mother finally responds. It's just a really touching moment to me and I really enjoy it and I would also say that I really enjoy in this book just how discussions happen around young girls. The adults and the young adults in the situation think that these preteen girls are not really understanding the conversations that they are having um, but these girls are most definitely understanding and taking all of these bits of information in and the things that they are talking about are at times inappropriate or they are just heavy or hard. They definitely affect a preteen kid. The next one I don't have a book for because I listened to it on audiobook and I didn't tap the book out from the library and that was for What Made Maddie Run. This is a book that's been on my TBR for quite a long time. It looks into the pressures of what it's like to be a college student, especially as a college athlete, as happens to Maddie Holleran, who is the person that we're mostly following. And she committed suicide her first year at UPenn to try to figure out what it is that happened and what her family and friends understood was happening and then kind of the aftermath of that, how her family is coping as a result. I don't think I've ever read a book that has so specifically laid out like point by point what those pressures are like, what they feel like as a student, and what the media, society, and culture, and our friends and family do and say in the background of that. Young teenagers suffer in silence through these situations and just try to get through it. As someone who was only born two years before Maddie, we're very similar in age and we were going to college during the same time period. It's definitely a book that made me think a lot. I think it's a book that expresses the millennial experience of college pressures and mental health really well and I would definitely recommend it for those aspects of it. I ended up giving it four stars. A book that I finished just today is this chunker, Moonflower Murders by Anthony Horowitz. When I first started this book, I thought it was 400 pages. It's a 600 page book and it's a book that has two mysteries running through it. So at first you're introduced to a certain set of characters in the present day and then you're taken into Atticus Pun's book 
by Alan Conway, who we learned about in Magpie Murders. Then after you're done with that book in the book, then you're back to the main mystery that you started with. I think both mysteries were interesting and captivating enough for me to want to know what happened. There were definitely moments that made me gasp or made me go, oh my god, the audiobook is really great in this book. Just like Magpie Murders was really great on audiobook, I would definitely recommend the audiobook experience. I would say I would want this book to be shorter. I feel like there's just aspects of it where there's a lot of talking and a lot of questioning and a lot of like extra stuff in there that is not that necessary. I also wonder how I would have felt if the book in the book was either shorter or wasn't in there but instead Susan Ryland, who's the main character investigating, would be telling us like the important aspects of the book that she is looking into, how it connects to the main mystery. But definitely go into this for like cottage vibes, small town vibes, people who seem like ordinary citizens who have grudges and they're all doing bad things and I really enjoy those aspects in a mystery. I definitely recommend Anthony Horowitz and I will keep reading him. I gave this three and a half stars. All right, I'm here to film the last clip for this video. These are the last five things that I ended up reading in December. The first one that I haven't talked about is Notes on a Silencing by Lacey Crawford. I listened to this on audiobook. It's narrated by the author. I definitely recommend going that route. This is a book about the author's experience during a sexual assault that happened to her during her teens when she was at a very fancy, a prestigious boarding school. The administrators, just the culture in general of the school, what they really did to shame her for this happening to her and then also how they silenced her so that she wouldn't talk about what happened to her. What that meant for her relationship with her family, with her friends at school, how she became kind of a social pariah. Mostly it's an in-depth look into what is happening in her brain. What is she thinking about her own self-worth and how she is surviving. This is a very visceral and mature and explicit description of what that experience is like. She has this no holds barred way of describing it that I liked because it is honest and it is true but it's also very hard to stomach. I would also say that the writing style of this book might not be for everyone. It's got flowery language and the way she describes some things have this MFA kind of style to them that might not work for everyone. I can read you an example so you can kind of get a vibe. As a 15 year old, I found sleep KG receding when it was intended and swamping me in the day. It worked for me. I like when authors write like that. I think it's also important to know that this does not have a linear timeline. You do jump around back and forth in time. But this is a really important book. This is a book that I really enjoyed just for being led into her story because you could very easily write a memoir and keep things out to protect yourself and she didn't do that. So if you read Chanel Miller's memoir and liked it, this is something that I would compare to that. I really enjoyed this and I gave it four and a half stars. After that, I mostly read graphic novels and really short fiction to finish up the year. The first one was Measuring Up by Lily Lamont and Anne Zhu. This is a story about a girl who moves from Taiwan to Seattle. She joins a cooking competition to try to win money so that she could get her grandmother to come visit her for her grandmother's birthday. It's about her developing friendships and trying to balance schoolwork with this cooking competition. This was missing just a little bit of an emotional impact for me where I didn't feel like I bonded or connected with the characters as much as I wanted to. Instead in here there's a lot about the mechanics of the cooking competition and I wish we had spent less time with like the who is moving on from this round and what did everybody cook aspect of the process and spent more time building the emotional connection between me and the characters and I gave it three stars. After that I finished Finding Langston. It focuses on a young boy who moves with his father from Alabama to Chicago during the Great Migration in the 1940s to find better opportunities in Chicago and then the main character Langston trying to fit in and become a part of this new community even though everybody's looking down on him for being a country boy. I thought this was short and sweet, uplifting, and heartwarming in parts but I wish that it had been a little bit longer. I feel like if the book had been 50 or 75 more pages I would have understood and cared so much more for Langston and I thought that it ended a little bit too abruptly but what am I expecting from a book that is 110 pages I guess but definitely do recommend if you like historical middle grade fiction. This is a really nice setting piece in the 1940s in Chicago. I've never read a book set there during that time period. I gave it three and a half stars.
After that, I read a book that is the reason why I never put up a best books of the year list until my reading is literally complete on December 31st at 11.59 p.m. And it's because this book was a five star and I really, really loved it and it's definitely going to end up on my best of list. And that's Kent State, Four Dead in Ohio by Derf Bachdorf. This is a graphic nonfiction work about what happened in the Kent State shootings that were committed by the National Guard in response to protests that had been going on for many days on campus and it was this really big miscommunication between the National Guard, the police officers, all different kinds of agencies that were infiltrating in the area. I think what this book does well is laying out the context and the historical background. Durf did a lot of research into the history and you can read in the end notes exactly where he found what for each spread that he made. I really value that i definitely spend a lot of time reading that back end basically going on the internet and googling things and searching things and listening to music and watching videos and that's something that i really enjoy in books that have and notes that serve as such a jumping off point kind of captivated me for quite a few hours as i was just like searching everything that is a signifier of a great book i think another thing that this book does great is to humanize the students that were killed we are following them in those days prior and we learn about them and i think another thing that i really loved about this book is how it taught me so many new things obviously i knew that four people died in Kent, the kent state shootings but i didn't know how many other people were hurt and maimed i also didn't know how far away some people were when these shootings happened how some of them weren't even protesters i didn't know that days before the national guard had bayoneted like used their bayonets to stab students that were out in the street so obviously there's this ratcheting tension that you see and you witness through these days before may 4th and those are things that i didn't really know about also come to this so you can see the way that Durf portrays Richard Nixon. It is amazing. Totally recommend if you read graphic nonfiction for sure. This is something that you need to pick up. And then last but not least, the one that I finished on New Year's Eve was Seance Tea Party by Raymina Yi. Something that was really cool is she's actually a Malaysian graphic novelist that is publishing out of Australia and that it got like a major publication in the United States. I I thought that was pretty cool. This is a story that focuses on ghosts, as you can see the ghost up here. The main character, Laura, how Laura makes friends with this ghost, where this ghost came from, and the central themes and questions in this graphic novel about grappling with growing up as a girl. I have to be into that so I can be cool and be part of, you know, the groups, feeling like maybe you have other things that you're more interested in. Some of those messages and themes were a little bit too on the nose for me. Overall, I like the characters and I like the story. I love the art and this. I think the art is fabulous. And that is it for my December wrap up. I don't know how I'm going to do wrap ups in the new year. I'm considering a few options. I hope that you enjoyed this longish video and I hope that you're having a great new year. As always, if you read any of these books or would like to read any of them, let me know in the comments and I'll see you in my next video. Bye bye.